Hi, everyone, and welcome to our fifth global town hall. I'm glad to see so many of you here today. Uh, we've got a lot to cover in the next 90 minutes, so let's just go ahead and get started. Uh, we want to welcome Dr. Bernie Jaworski, who is the Drucker Chair at the Claremont Graduate University, who is joined by the SMA management team of AJ and Jacques. So the Organic Growth Playbook discussion is the fifth in our series of global town halls. Previous sessions included managing careers, take responsibility for your growth, how to thrive in the gig economy, rethinking the on-demand workforce, and Drucker's five questions. If you'd like to watch the previous global town halls, the videos are available on the SMA SharePoint website, or just contact Nicole Matar at nicole.matar at smawins.com. The Organic Growth Playbook has been called the marketing of the 21st century in an age where the options of goods and services available to consumers and businesses have proliferated. Just think of mustards in your local supermarket. There's tons of them. There's tons of everything. And in an increasingly competitive business environment as well. We will soon hear Dr. Jaworski's thoughts on organic growth and a 21st century approach to driving revenues. We've entered a macroeconomic world where firms need to create their own growth. Uh, there's more to growth besides acquisitions. Organic growth presents a framework focusing on key customer behaviors that will enable a more effective approach to not just product marketing, but to business development, sales, and overall operations. The key tenant of organizational growth, which is to activate high yield customer behavior to achieve extraordinary results, applies to all departments, not just marketing. And we'll stress this point strongly. There's a lot to absorb during today's town hall. Uh, kindly, Dr. Jaworski has offered a copy of his book, The Organic Growth Playbook, to all the attendees, and we will reach out to all attendees to offer a personally autographed copy of the playbook to you. So that you understand the agenda of part one of today's town hall, I just want to provide a bit of an overview of today's presentation, which are the five principles of organic growth. First principle is mapping the buying process waterfall, a reminder to us all regarding the need to understand the client through interviews and hard data compilation, not just personal subjective opinions. Second principle is propensity-based segmentation. Just a quick note during this discussion, there's a bit of an emphasis on cosmetics. Now, most of us are not in the cosmetic industry, but you can just take the underlying themes that are presented to your industry. The third principle are the critical drivers and most importantly, the critical behaviors component of the organic growth playbook. Dr. Jaworski will stress the barriers of targeted behavior, often overlooked when we consider our clients. Also reviewed is the issue of credibility. It's common knowledge that a recommendation from a trusted friend has a powerful effect on customer thinking. The fourth principle, involves developing behavior change as part of a value proposition. Relationships are critical for remarkable results. And finally, the fifth principle discusses the business practice of investing this proportionately, contrary to the current practice where firms try to be everything to everyone. There's an Oscar-nominated film this year, Everything Everywhere All at Once. Perhaps uh, the concept of this firm came from the playbook. Uh, what's great about receiving your own copy of the Organic Growth Playbook is that these five key principles are discussed in detail with guidance on how to create your own playbook for organic growth. Uh, remember, the Organic Growth Playbook challenges conventional wisdom for both B2B and B2C companies in a variety of industries. So I don't want to give away the whole speech. Uh, many of our audience members know me as the SMA Town Hall Art Talk official. Um, recently, I just did a session on Banksy, including his own approach to organic growth with Banksy Land. Um, and we'll show the Banksy Land Art Talk at the end of the Global Town Hall today for those interested in his organic growth expansion. Some housekeeping notes. Feel free to type any questions in the chat. We'll do our best to respond to all the inquiries at the end of our session. And we encourage open and honest communication. And again, we value your input. Um, also, at the end of our session, we will ask for your comments via a quick survey. 
So sit back, relax, grab your cup of coffee, and without further ado, let me turn the session over to Dr. Jaworski and AJ. Hello, Bernie and AJ. Now today we are filming at the Peter F. Drucker School of Management of the Claremont Graduate University, and we'll be discussing the very elusive goal of all, every company, which is growth, and namely organic growth, not growth through acquisitions. And today we are going to be speaking with Dr. Uh, Bernie Jaworski, uh, who is the Peter F. Drucker Chair here at the Drucker School of Management. And um, so Bernie, you and Bob Lurie wrote this groundbreaking book called The Organic Growth Playbook. And um, I, think, uh, I think the American Marketing Association referred to it as a, the, basically the 21st century approach to marketing, right? Can you tell us a little bit about kind of the, what that really means? So there's a really interesting history here, which is most people, when they think of driving organic growth, think of the conventional methodology to do that, which is typically you find a market, you segment that market, you select a target segment, you position an offering in the minds of target customers, and then you activate with some form of four piece. So when you say segment, you mean like perhaps like age or income or geography? Or and there's a million ways to do okay. it, as you well know. So yeah. it's anything from lifestyle to customer uh -huh. benefit base to industry verticals to demographics to firmographics, a million ways to oh. do it, right? So it's a large way to think about segmentation, but what happens at the end of the day is everybody recommends focusing on one or two segments and everybody recommends positioning your offering in the marketplace such that you have a differentiation in the minds mm -hmm. of your target customers, and then you activate. Now, that's the way we've been teaching and, marketing. And that's the 20th century approach, It's right? the 20th century. Okay. So for 70 years, everybody who takes a marketing class, an undergraduate program, mm -hmm. or an MBA program, gets marketing delivered this way. Hmm. Everybody does. Now, there may be some school, some faculty out there floating around that does it differently, but every single textbook's organized that way. Every single case book is sort of organized that way. So that's the way everybody teaches it. The catch is back in the 90s, uh, Bob and I started to look at markets and we realized that it actually doesn't work, which is <laughs> kind of interesting. So it works a third of the time, third of the time sales go down, third of the time sales stay the same. <laughs> and what happens is that the client looks at it and says, ah, we didn't segment the market correctly. Ah, we selected the wrong target segment. Ah, competition came into the marketplace much mm -hmm. more aggressively. Or they may say, we did the process right, but we didn't have the right team. We didn't hire the right people. Or there may be macroeconomic conditions that get in the way. Mm -hmm. So the explanation wasn't the framework. The explanation was either internal dynamics of our organization or the external marketplace operated in a way and unfolded in a way we didn't expect. Nobody said, wait, wait, let's take a look at whether we got this uh. thing right. Now, if you think about it for two seconds, you realize differentiation is impacting the minds of our customers, which is great. Mm -hmm. You want a differentiation. But differentiation, operating the minds of a target customer, then what's supposed to happen is, then there's a black box, and then somebody behaves a particular way. So the question is, for you to drive organic growth, you need to change behavior. This is the, kind of the dirty little secret of marketing. Yeah, you want to have a differentiated offering, but you want to be able to connect that to some behavior, right? And so what we realized was if marketing is fundamentally about behavior change, you bought Pepsi and I want you to buy Coke, or you bought a certain number amount of product from me and I want you to buy much more product, or I want you to buy this product plus mm -hmm. other products, then let's focus on the behavior change. The second thing we learned was you can have behavior change at the product choice level or at the brand level. That's a tough game to play. You go down to the you know, any supermarket and you see, look at the mustard aisle. You had 875 mustards to choose from, right? <laughs> you know that's a tough game to play when you're playing. But if, on the other hand, if I could influence their thinking about mustards way before they actually think about mustards, and it's not it's not necessarily advertising or communication. Yeah. It could be other things floating around in how they think about things. Then if I could influence that upstream behavior in a way that shifts that behavior and it has a path dependency to increase the likelihood to buy my product downstream, mm -hmm. now you've got something mm -hmm. you're playing with. So, so can we take uh, two examples? The Pepsi Taste Challenge, if I remember right, in yeah. the old days, right? Yeah. yeah. So was there some theory behind why they did something like that? Well, in this particular case, this is now focused at the brand yeah. choice level, uh -huh. which is a behavior that you can focus on. What they realized was that, and when they did their work months before that, they realized blind taste testing 
Pepsi tasted better than Coke, but the vast majority of customers. Right? And that's a product feature that they were. That's a product okay. feature play, right? Okay. So if if they could get people to sample, mm -hmm. at some point, <laughs> someone could sample a Pepsi. The thinking was, ah, you know, downstream later at some point they sample a a Pepsi at a restaurant, then theoretically, you know, <laughs> three months later, if they're buying a Pepsi, you know, they're yeah. going to buy the Pepsi. The catch with that one, AJ, is that the problem is that people had this perception of Coke. When you're brand loyal to Coke, that, that got in the way of doing any behavior change, right? So yes, it was a good campaign in the sense that yes, you could taste that, but the problem was that the Coke legacy, the Coke brand, the perception yeah. of people's view of Coke was so strong it overrode got the it. actual taste. So they weren't so that those those tasting events weren't really able to change the behavior down the road. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to mustard. Uh, uh, I always think of Greg Poupon. Yeah. That's great commercials, right? Can you yeah. kind of speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so this is all still 20th century marketing, right? Yeah, yeah, this is all 20th century yeah. marketing. I mean, I, yeah, I think, you know, so so mustard mustard at the time Grey Poupon launched, mustard was a commodity product. Yeah, mm -hmm. you had Gouldens, you had the yellow mustard, you had a few other mustard brands, yeah. right? But what's really interesting about Grey Poupon is that everybody's playing at this price point. Right. Grey Poupon said we're going to play way up here. Now, you know, is Grey Poupon from France? No, <laughs> it's not from France. It's, you know, it's from the Midwest, right? But Grey Poupon sounded French. And you're arriving with your limousine and you're sharing your Grey Poupon <laughs> with the other guy with their Rolls Royce. Right. Sort of like, oh, yeah, this is the bit. So they went high price. And, and, and to this day, yeah. Grey Poupon <laughs> is priced higher and has this sort of image, right? By the way, that notion of legacy, the idea, a lot of companies leave the brand images hmm. they've created early in the marketplace and they move to other stuff. But the reality is that there's an enormous amount of, of you know, it's called spreading of activation. In customers' minds, they have a particular node in your mind, in this case around mustards and the category of mustards. Mm -hmm. And once you kind of lock and load, you create all these associations, you should never leave them behind. And one of the challenges of Great Poupon is they've left them behind. Mm -hmm. So when you see a lot of legacy advertising yeah. where you pull back advertising from much more layer, that's smart because it's leveraging all of the good work they did to influence the customer's mind that they've sort of left behind. And I, <laughs> I, I, see, I see people doing that a lot where they, 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 they don't go back in time, time. To, to create yeah. this enormous legacy of, of, of data that they have related to this. You know, wow. Coke's a pretty good job about this because Coke does, every Christmas does some funky oh, right. you know, advertising. Hey, teach the world to sing. Right. In perfect harmony, right? Yeah. Where is that? That should be brought back. <laughs> that we, the world and needs that. And it has that nothing now. to do with Coke. Red nothing. Right. Nothing. No, no, yeah. 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 <laughs> so as, as you and Bob started to develop this thinking, did you say it was in the 90s? Or? It was in the 90s. 90s, okay. Were there any particular case examples of companies' failure that really kind of motivated this new thinking, that this aha moment has said, maybe there's a whole different approach? I'm not sure there was a eureka uh -huh. moment. I think what happened is it was Bob who said, who somehow introduced the idea of let's map the end-to-end -end buying process in a lot of detail to see what customers are actually doing. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he thought mm -hmm. differently about positioning or differentiation at the time. He just thought, let's try and understand the end-to-end -end buying process. Very importantly uh, for those listening in, this is not customer experience journey mapping. Customer experience journey mapping is mapping the end-to-end -end process, which you need to do, and looking for pain points or areas of delight, okay. but it assumes that everybody works their way through the process. Got it. The buying process mapping is not just mapping in excruciating detail the various stages of buying and the behaviors within those stages, but most importantly, you're looking at the drop-off rates, the waterfall. And you're trying to figure uh, out, I've lost a lot of people way upstream here, and I'm fighting it out at with 10 customers, 10% 10 of the market way down at brand choice, when, when I've lost 90% of the market upstream. So losing, so Bob's big insight was, what about these drop-off rates? How can I influence it. people to stay in the yeah, process? Versus where they drop yeah, off. So understanding yeah. that choice that they yeah. make to drop yeah. off. And, and also okay. the other thing that's kind of interesting is when people drop out of a process, yeah. it also signals a different segmentation also, oftentimes. Ah. So, for example, if you're looking, if you're looking at, uh, if you're looking at, for example, army recruiting, and that's okay. just a buying process. Mm -hmm. But think about army recruiting. Very early in the process, if the army army wants to recruit soldiers in, they look at high school graduates and they kind of want to flow through. But early in the process, probably 65 percent of the kids say, "I want to go to college," and they immediately fall out. Well, that segmentation says, "Ah, we have kids that are segmentation segmenting themselves." 
towards a career that may be vocational versus a career that's sort of college yeah. educated. And that right? could be influenced by family, it could be influenced by lots parents. Of, lots of different choices. Without really the, right. The, right. the student really understanding right. what choice they're actually implicitly making. Right. right? And if you yeah. say, if, so the Army could look at those 65% that mm -hmm. fall and say, well, not much right. to do. Or they could say, actually, we want, we want half yeah. of those kids to stay in. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, the Army is your way to get a free college education. Mm -hmm. Basically, we're going to pay four years of your college mm -hmm. education, and you just and just you just have to wait. You come into the army, you deliver your service. We're going to pay for your college when you get out, and better position you for a job afterwards. And, right? Because yeah. now you have the experience of, say, yeah. for example, a logistics job in the army, and then you go to a business right. school. You learn logistics. Now you have four years of experience plus logistics, and bam, you're off and running. Now you've kept not sixty five percent losing it, but maybe thirty percent fell out and thirty yeah. percent stayed in. So. It's a, it's a good way to think about it. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, okay. it's just a different way to think about how it is that I keep people in the process or facilitate yeah. kind of activities. But what we've learned, just to go to the headline here, is for every single firm we work with, and we work with hundreds over the last 20 years, there's always some point upstream in the buying process that if you influence it, there's a path dependency. It's like the ski slope. And for anybody who loves to ski, if you start at the very top of the mountain and you start to go down the mountain uh -huh. one way, you're kind of stuck. You're going to Lodge A, or you're going to ski you lift. Got it, right. And if you, you know. don't have the skill to navigate that hill, you're really stuck. <laughs> you really are stuck, yeah. We all been caught at the double black oh, time yeah. where we look down the hill and we think, uh -oh. how do I get down there? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly, yeah. So, so mapping the buying process seemed like the, the, the initial aha, uh -huh. and rather than kind of figuring out how to attract consumers or, or, or clients, right, is really understanding where they dropped off. Yeah. That was the key aha moment for you. So buying, mapping the buying process, I think, was one of five principles in the book, right? There are five principles yeah. in the mm -hmm. book, AJ, and in this next two minutes, I'm going to run through all five <laughs> okay. principles, right? So this is normally an hour and a half, but I'm going to do it for two minutes, so okay. you have to kind of lean in here at this point. <laughs> so number one is you search upstream for a particular behavior to change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the funnest example I give is this girl, Teenage Girls Cosmetics, right? Sparkle, I think, in Sparkle your book, right? Sparkle in the book, yeah. yeah. It's a chapter yeah. in the book. Yeah. And what we found was if teenage girls that are 12, 13, 14 are sampling, are not sampling our brand, are not sampling our brand at the point of purchase display, typically in drugstores, they buy it 12% of the time. If the girls sample, they actually take the cosmetics out, mm -hmm. and they put lipsticks on, and they put some makeup on, and do, do some uh, nail polish, they buy it 76% of the time. Wow, what a what a flip. Yeah. Yeah. So 12% for 76%. Yeah. So we had advised the, the client to do take all the money away from social media, take all the money away from celebrity advertising, and put it in the purchase display. Let's let hmm. other people do celebrity advertising, social media, to drive people to the point of purchase display. And when they get there, they say, wow, this is the biggest display. It has all these mirrors. Mm -hmm. It has all these colors. We've taken it out of blister packs. We can sample. And, and as you know, teenage girls often sample, often go in wolf packs. You know, they arrive with two or three. So they're having fun at the point of purchase display, right? And you know, it, incremental sales went up a hundred million dollars over a three-year period. It became one of the top five cool teenage brands. So point number one is first principles: look for these high yield behaviors, not just differentiating the offer. Number two: look for teenage girls that have a propensity, a likelihood that they want to sample. Who are the teenage girls that like to sample? Well, they're teenage girls that are much more social, teenage girls that like to shop with their friends. So when one of the, you know, so you're looking for propensity-based segments. Let's not have girls come to the store that don't like the sample. Let's go after the ones that like the sample. So segment based on propensity mm -hmm. to engage in the behavior. So your marketing dollars should go against that. Correct. Okay. Right. It doesn't mean you don't spend some money on differentiation, yeah. but maybe you're spending 75% on yeah. behavior change. Third step is look at the drivers and barriers mm -hmm. that get in the way of those making those changes. Fourth step is develop a value proposition for the behavior change. Why should the teenage girl sample at the point of purchase display? What's the value proposition? Well, it's fun, it's exciting. So, so that's a key point. So it's not the value proposition for the product. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So the fourth principle is behavior change, value proposition. And the fifth principle is bet the farm. Uh, don't don't spread your resources, what we call <laughs> peanut butter marketing. Don't. Everybody loves to spread money across all stages of the buying process. It's the wrong thing to do. You want to disproportionately spend at that particular choke point in the field of battle where you yeah. can really leverage that. And you got to place bets at the level of allocation of the segment and allocation of the behavior change. And people don't like to do that. Yeah. People are trained to spread their money across lots of marketing media. It's the wrong thing to do. If I see somebody who develops a marketing plan where they're using 87 media capitals, 2% here, 8% there, 4% there, I say that they don't know what they're doing. They're spreading their dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Don't have a focus, and, and which perhaps leads to the fact that you don't have a true understanding. 
what you're saying. That's exactly okay. right. All right. By the way, this yeah. is the, uh, you know it's funny huh. when you when you work with technology companies uh-huh. or you work with life science company. <laughs> I a lot of times call this evidence based marketing <laughs> because you have the evidence. You collected the data to understand that's the behavior right there. You quantify that behavior, and by the way, you can measure that behavior. So if you watch in a drugstore, how many teenage girls actually sample? At, the, at our brand, right. you can actually quantitatively measure that behavior and tie that quantitatively to sales. So when you talk about look at the return on investment or marketing, you, you can actually you can measure it. You can measure it. Well, I think on Sparkle, you sent out like seven thousand surveys, right? And actually, got, for Sparkle, yeah. interesting enough, so for energy services, uh-huh. we did eight hundred customer interviews to figure out what's going on. Eight hundred. Yeah. Wow. So, um, but in teenage girls, a lot of the issue was observing them. In their natural oh, environment, okay. <laughs> sort of like you know going on the African so, safari. So you had and folks the at drugstores. We had folks at drugstores, watching, observing them, observing, because they're not going to tell you, "Hey, I sampled the brand." You know, you know, you need to just be, you need to just be observing what was going on within the store. Sounds a considerable investment on Spark. It's a lot of part. investment. Yeah. yeah, but you know what's funny about that, AJ? Is you don't have to do six thousand of these. You know, if you show up and you watch fifty or sixty experiences, uh, you can probably get a feel for mm-hmm. what's going on, right? And so, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, in different, by the way, this relates to different types of methods. So, for example, in the world of B2C, we end up doing a lot of quantitative stuff with large numbers. In the world of B2C, I gave an example of energy services, 800 data points. But for the world of B2B, it's oftentimes you have very right. consolidated mm-hmm. and customers. And smaller numbers. Right. Much smaller 20 or 30 numbers. or, yeah. when you're going in, you got to do really mm-hmm. in-depth qualitative yeah. work as opposed to quantitative yeah. work. So when you map out the buying process, can you describe kind of how long that typically takes? Yeah, so there's a great question of burden of proof. So let me give yeah. you two stories. So in one case, I just did some work for a uh, machine learning AI company that's selling software um, into R&D uh, mm-hmm. groups inside of B2B. Here, what we did is we basically, we, we spent two, two or three weeks n- not even collecting what we knew about the marketplace, what we knew about what was happening with our sales reps interacting the marketplace, and talking to a lot of people who are interacting with customers. We probably had 15 data points that we're using. But Mm -hmm. with those 15 data points, we realized there was a magical thing that could happen way upstream in the buying process. And I I don't know. So there's an early insight. There was an early insight, right? And then we went back and tested it. Yeah. And then we said, oh, this is the insight, right? So in this case, we we, we didn't really do a lot, enormous amount. And we said, let's hold that as the working hypothesis. And now for the next six months, let's test it, right? Got it. And then six months from now, we'll revisit Mm -hmm. the behavioral objective. But uh, but in other customers like this large HVAC system where you're talking about the energy si- services, the energy are, where you're talking about situations where there's you know millions of dollars at stake, if not tens of millions of dollars at stake, any buying occasion, the burden of proof goes way up, right? So they want to see the quantitative data. They want to see that was 800 in depth yeah, interviews, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that yeah. must have taken some some while. Yeah, and really it wasn't in all, not all uh-huh. were in depth interviews. Yeah. We did we did look at eight hundred buying occasions mm-hmm. and tried to try try. And oh, okay. So there weren't all in depth interviews, but they were. Yeah. They, we did have eight hundred things that we looked wow. at in order to kind of map out what was going on. Yeah. But I typically find there's a front end qualitative part and yeah. a back end quantitative part because the qualitative part gets you a better understanding, of it. and then you go out and confirm yeah. it, right? And in the case of uh, the energy services company, that early that insight you developed in terms of really early very early actually in that whole buying process yeah. uh, end up being a very pivotal uh, so let's talk, activity, right? Yeah, let's yeah. talk about that one. So the energy services company um, had a sales force that, was, that largely stayed in the office and accepted RFPs mm-hmm. and looked at them and then competed. That was the way the market worked. We said to them, that's one way to deal with it, but there may be a set of customers floating around out there where, um, where that's not the right process. You can get in front of this, not play the RFP game, but actually get in front of this whole process. Even though they probably would still have to respond to an RFP down the road, they're going to well, companies have a policies to, to compete, right? Continue yeah. to do. That. Okay, all right. But yeah. let's try some resource, try and figure out maybe there's something else we can do, uh-huh. where you know, uh, you know, you know, those who write the specs get the checks, right? So right. Like, do you, do you do something <laughs> around the front end of this process, right? So what we did is we just started to talk. So the cus- the sales reps felt they had a really good feel for what the process was. They had an idea that maybe seven or eight steps in the process. When we actually went into the customers and looked at the customers and what was going on behind mm-hmm. the curtain, it was like a 13 or 14 step process. So first off, they missed six steps. Second thing is in many B2B situations, there's a cast of characters involved. Mm-hmm. Four or five or six people. Yeah, more involved. than just one decision maker. 
These are large purchases yeah. that require capital outlay. Not all the times you can do some small projects, but oftentimes capital outlay. So you have the chief financial officer involved. You have the CEO involved sometimes. You definitely have procurement involved. Right. You have the facility manager involved. You have other, so there's a bunch of people involved. So the question is, who has, out of the 13 stages of the buying process, who's involved at what stage and how much weight do they have? How much can they influence the process? It's a mm -hmm. great question, right? Well, it turns out, to jump to the punchline, the facilities manager turns out to be a critical person early in the process to figure out, do, mm -hmm. we, need, do we actually need this service? What service yeah. do we need? What products do we need? What are the right specifications? So let's pause for a second. Most people would have intuitively said CEO, COO, CFO. If I can get them bought in, I've got it. I've, I've, I've essentially have it slotted in for myself, right? Even if there's an RFP. But you've, this insight is different, right? It's it's really not the high level folks that if you can kind of say I've got to in with. It's really the individual that's the facility manager who's responsible for the system. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of surprising. Yeah. Right? Now, if someone took the CEO out to the other and did some other stuff right. on the way, could they overpower the facilities manager? <laughs> Maybe so, right? But in this case, the facility manager is somebody, well, to, to jump to mm -hmm. the punchline a little bit, you don't want to talk to every facility manager, right? If you, if you, you know, you, the, the basic takeaway early in the process was, number one is they didn't know there were 13 steps. Mm -hmm. Number two is they didn't know the facility manager played such a significant role. And number three, which is the big insight here, is that Turns out, if we got a meeting with a facility manager way before the actual RFP was specified, hmm. 12, 18 months before, if we got a meeting with them and talked about our thought leadership, talked about the mm -hmm. evolution of the industry, talked about new products are coming online, talked about the evolution of digital, all this stuff we talked to them, the probability we won the work 12 months later went up 4x. And is that about creating that relationship of trust or is it about introducing it's, new ideas or uh -huh. it's everything actually. everything okay i think it's at some empathy uh -huh. some sense this person's there operating in my best interest right. they're sharing thought leadership around the evolution of the industry sure we have our products in the space but here's where we think it's going now hold that thought hmm. the question then becomes let's say it is the facility manager that's critical mm -hmm. do you want to talk to every single facility manager in the world no we want to talk to facility managers who, who can't or literally if the email pops up and says, I want to talk to you about this trend, the facility manager says, I can't wait to talk to you guys, right? So it's, again, propensity, uh, for, the, I, okay. propensity for the facility <laughs> manager to want to take the meeting, right? They right. want to take the meeting, right? So who, who's the facility manager who wants to take the meeting? Well, number one, they own lots of properties, not one. Number two, they have a lot of square footage, not small amount of square footage. It's a lot of stake. There's a lot of, stake. there's strict energy codes, yeah. and prices are significant in the huh. region. So you have four screens that sales reps can lead say, do they, own lots of, do they have lots of buildings? Do they have lots of square footage? Are there strict energy codes? Blah, blah, blah. That four screen process, 91% of the time, the facility manager will take the meeting. 91% of the time, right? So you're not kind of wasting a lot of time trying to do you know, You're very clear who those folks are, right? Now, they take the meeting, that's great. Are they gonna change their behavior? Like, you know, i.e., what are the factors that get in the way? Even though it's 91% likelihood, there's still drivers and barriers to take the meeting. So I still need to have a value proposition for why you wanna take the meeting with me, right, in terms of behavior change. Now, Th that's the value proposition for behavior change. Correct. Got it. Now, okay. you still, this particular okay. brand was one of the top five brands in the yeah. marketplace. So you still had a differentiated product, offering, uh -huh. right? And, and, but it were five other products, yeah. right? So they're all pretty darn good, you know? Uh, but you did took the meeting, and as a result of taking the meeting, you could drive disproportionate levels of growth. Interesting. But you, wow. but, but let's pause for a okay. moment. You have to have quantitative data. You have to map the process in excruciating detail. You have to be willing to segment the market based upon propensity, not based upon benefits or traditional yeah. or industry verticals or other ways of thinking. So, there's a lot of change that has to come through. So you have to buy. You have to buy the playbook. You have to buy the methodology. You have to buy the. <laughs> you idea. have to buy the book. You have to buy the yeah, very book. <laughs> You, you can't get anywhere without buying the book. All right. Yeah. Now, one of the funny parts of the book, AJ, which is this is Bob and I's decision. We gave away all of our IP. So in the book, if you read the book carefully, yeah, you certainly don't need us. You can do it yourself. But the problem is that there's a lot of nuances. Uh, it's, so, it's, so, it, so, yeah, so. more than nuances. Yeah. I think some of the concepts uh, both of you have put forth in the book are actually very sophisticated. Yeah. And so you talked about propensity. You talked about understanding fall-off rates versus pull-in rates, right, which is like 20th century marketing. Segmentation is could be a very complex topic, particularly the way that you and Bob are thinking about it. Can we talk complex. about that for a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> so let me let me let me speak. Let me give my little mini lecture on segmentation okay. for a second here. 
Uh, so I've been thinking about this issue for like 20 years. Mm-hmm. It took me about 15 years to figure this thing out, which is you, you, the first observation about segmentation is everybody thinks that you segment because of the demand side. So in other words, why do I segment? I segment because when I look into the marketplace, these people segment A buy differently than segment B, who buy differently than segment C, and man, if I try to meet the needs of A and B at the same time, I'm going to screw it all up, right? So I've got to be able to look at the demand side that, gee whiz, I have segment A, I have segment B, I have segment C, and i got to treat them differently, right? So everybody teaches segmentation from the demand side. That's what's going on in the marketplace. This is really interesting. I have to do this. But the reason you want to segment is also on the supply side. I don't want to treat, so people have talked the idea of one-to-one marketing, right? That I can move to one-to-one marketing now and that's the right way to go. Through social media yeah, and all that, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I actually, as a supplier to the market, want to see segments A, B, and C. I don't want to see 100 customers here, 1,000 customers there, 3,000 customers there, and treat everybody differently. I'd love to see segment A, B, and C. Why? Logistics, supply chain, product form, number of product types. Product right? features, all right, that, yeah. Right, I want markets to right. segment because I want to target segment A, not B and C, and I want to uniquely go out. Now within A, there's some variation, a one-to-one, fine. But I want segment A, because my cost structure will change. And when you think about your competition, that plays heavily into that. Yeah, because they can be serving that whole market, which creates a different cost structure for them, and I can play on my cost structure in segment A. So you want segmentation for both demand side Hmm. and supply side reasons, point number one. Point number two, which is a really important point, is segmentation is a source of competitive advantage. Segmentation is the source of competitive advantage. People typically think about competitive advantage from the standpoint of positioning, or they think of competitive advantage by industry choice, that's right. the quarter like, or they think of competitive advantage based upon your capabilities. So you position the same way in the marketplace, but you have different capabilities, right? But a fourth way to gain competitive advantage beyond industry structure, positioning, and capabilities is segment choice. And what do I mean by that? If, if everybody believes the market is segment A, B, and C, and they organize and structure themselves for A, B, and C, uh, then everybody's playing a game that, where they basically so, said that's a commodity. Yeah. So let's pause for a second. So yeah. if you think about 20th century marketing, most segmentation was on obvious attributes. Yeah. Like we talked about some of those earlier, which means that if I was uh, one of the companies in a particular industry, it's likely my segmentation will look very much like all my other competitors' segmentation, yes. right? Yes. So now you're thinking, you yeah. segment differently, yeah. you're creating a better advantage. Yeah. Let me let me let me speak. Okay. So one of my jokes that I do when I when I'm in uh-huh. most high tech companies <laughs> is I say, you guys won't believe this. It's the first time I meet these guys, okay. right? And I say, and I'll have like ten people right. there, maybe CMO and some other guys, and I'll say, you won't believe it, but I just left this tech company just behind me, and they segment their market by industry verticals, and then if they get really fancy, they look at big customers, medium customers, and small customers within those verticals. I said, that is the craziest idea ever in terms of how they segment their market. And what will happen is people in the room will say, well, that's how we segment our market. Because <laughs> every high tech company does it the same way. And I say, guess what? That means you're basically saying, you're giving up a source competitive advantage, you're going to compete within that industry mm-hmm. vertical for that big customer in your position. And so mm-hmm. therefore, your competitive ba- battlefield is mm-hmm. position, right? That's where your battlefield's going to be. On the other hand, if you say the market has historically been, uh, you know, segments A and B, A, B, and C, but I'm going to look at it different. Let's give it a concrete example. Everybody in the world thought there were three segments to the overall market of airline travel. First class, business <laughs> class, economy class. Every, not only that, but they designed their planes. First class, That's business class, right. economy class. Everybody had the exact same segmentation, right? And then all of a sudden you had low-cost carriers that said, I'm doing point-to-point travel. I'm Southwest Airlines. I don't care if there's first business. I just want short-haul travel. So it's not, it's not, it's, I'm taking the market, the market's this big, and I'm not saying first business and an economy. I'm slicing it this way, saying long-haul, short-haul, and I'm just gonna do short-haul, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and the airlines that were competing could have said, shit, I'm screwed. I can't abandon my first class business class, that's my whole model. I, I Yeah, I see what Southwest is doing. I can't do that, right? Mm-hmm. I have to do my model. Yeah, I see what they're doing, but I can't do that, right? That's a real interesting challenge. It's changing a paradigm. So, yeah. Instead yeah. of playing baseball, they're playing soccer. Yeah, here's another example. Huh. Here's another example. Tex Instruments back back in the uh, 80s, uh-huh. there was a guy named Richard Shar who took over as TI calculators back in the 80s. And Richard, I hope Richard's still with us this day, <laughs> but it's a great story. He went to talk to the CEO at the time, and the, and the lore, which I think the folklore within TI, and I think it's true, is Richard talked to the CEO, 
And he went to the CEO and, and, and Richard was going to take over the business. And, and the CEO said to him, okay, Richard, you're in charge of the business now. And, you know, go forth and, you know, multiply. And at the time, TI had less than 1% market share. And every single calculator broke after about six months. So, you know, what's Richard going to do? Well, everybody at the time said calculator market. You've got business. You've got small office, home office. You've got this, right? And Richard grew up as a teacher and said, you know what? There may be a market for this calculator for middle school and high school kids. I don't really know, but there may be a market here. But we had less than 1% of the market, and we have a calculator breaks all the time. So they went in and they said, you know, we're going to learn about how teachers use calculators and what they do. But again, this is back in the 80s and 70s where calculators were very expensive, mm -hmm. and, you know. So basically... It was they, either TI uh, or Casio. HP or yeah, Casio. Casio yeah, right. right. So Richard basically said... You know, I'm going to bet learning about how teachers use calculators and how they do them in the classroom. I'm going to study kids. I'm going to go into the classroom, mm -hmm. watch how they store them, where they put them, how they use them. Hmm. Fast forward to today, TI has a dominant market share, right? <clears throat> and there were stories of when TI would go to teacher conferences and they'd show, hey, our calculator or whatever it is, you know, we just moved the key over here, over there, and like standing ovation would break down. Like that was like a big innovation, right? You know, and I can guarantee you right now, we have we have we have an yeah. intern with us, Dinesh, right. who's with us right now, filming us. And I right. guarantee you, I could, I bet with I'll bet my career that Dinesh used the TI calculator in high school. Oh, I did. He did. Yeah, <laughs> so Casio, what's interesting about that is Casio is always the innovator. Right. The TI says we don't really care about it. Let the TI once Casio innovates and finds out a color ca or uh -huh. graphic calculator works, mm -hmm. then we'll do a graphic mm -hmm. calculator. Let's let's Casio yeah. figure out many colors. Right. Let's let them. And so it's actually literally, I think, required by teachers. They actually tell you which TI calculator. It's embedded in the textbook. It's embedded in the textbook. In the exams and everything. If you come, right. yeah. if you come home with a Casio, my page twenty-seven books, and hits the calculator, they're like, "You're screwed." Right. right. So you know, it's an enormous cash machine. Yeah. But, but the story here's my headline. The story is it was a segmentation issue. It wasn't um, a positioning issue. It was a segmentation issue. We saw a segment that was no one wanted, mm -hmm. no one cared about it, and it went after that. Edward Jones, story of going after financial mm -hmm. services in a rural market, not after a, a hmm. large market. Walmart, a story of going after a rural market, right? I Ikea, a story of going after people that are a cost-effective, mm -hmm. low-cost way, but you have to make trade-offs. You have to bring mm -hmm. the thing, bring home, you know, and, and kind of think. So all these yeah. stories of success yeah. are stories of so, segmentation. So this I think what you and Bob are doing, with, particularly with the book, is this isn't something that happens by happenstance or someone has a brilliant eureka moment, like, right? It's really, there's smart. a methodical approach. It's a, it's very, a methodical yeah. way yeah. to do this, yeah. right? So, you know, yeah. what's fun about this, the book and the method is it's teachable. Right. It's yeah. very teachable. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to read out of the book, actually, if you don't mind. Well, it's, it's like going back to the Bible. And, and well, he's going to read, you know, Isaiah, you know, verse 3, you know, right, okay. Genesis, you read so, from Genesis. So, so the uh, chapter so, 1 of the book is the... Uh, all right. So, so the last paragraph of chapter 5, okay? Re really important, but I think some very sophisticated concepts. A well-run, propensity-based segmentation process, therefore, accomplishes many difficult things at once, which I think what you're alluding to, right? It breaks through the dilemma that companies often face between having actionable segmentations based on easily observable customer attributes that are, however, not insightful, or you say very insightful. <laughs> and the opposite problem of designing highly meaningful segmentations that are impossible to implement. So you've got, it's, it's one or the other, both not good places to be, right? Yeah. It also ensures that the resulting segmentation will be proprietary Better advantage, right? And differentiated from the map that the rest of the industry is using. I so love that. That's I love that quote. Who wrote that? Quote? <laughs> Ooh, that's a. That's a. That is. I couldn't write that better. If I try to say it myself, I couldn't say it better than that was said there. I think it's tight and concise and spot on. So here's the headline: If you're segmenting the market the same way your competition is segmenting, you're screwed. You're giving up an enormous source of competitive advantage. Ninety-eight percent of the companies we work with segment the same way as other yeah. people. Right, and and it's just not going to get you to where you need to go. But to do it, it, it sounds like a very challenging thing to do. Because to do it, you have to understand the the buying process, the yep. waterfall, and the propensities Correct. around those behaviors. Correct. So it sounds like you have to have that value yeah. proposition about changing behaviors. So it, it's kind of where all these things come together, and then from there, it sounds like it's it's your market strategy. Well, what's beautiful about that is that. You're already talking about activation at the very mm -hmm. front end of the process. Mm -hmm. In a traditional marketing plan where you do, for example, benefit-based segmentation, and then you focus on something called the convenience segment, well, how do I find the convenience segment? Hmm. How, where do I find these people? They don't show yeah. up in the yellow pages. Under, hey, I'm a convenient. You know, right? You have to, you have to then do yeah. this funky thing at the back end to figure out 
how do I reach out to the convenience-oriented segments, right? You have to do some weird gymnastics. Whereas in our case, you say, that's the behavior. behavior. Early, step one, and everything is about that behavior. Bam, 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 bam. And it's a behavior that I can monitor, I can understand, and, I can track, yeah. I can get data. And are you segmenting around the behaviors, essentially? Yeah. You're, 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 you're se- it? yeah, it's exactly what you're trying to okay. do. You're trying to segment based upon their likelihood of engaging in that particular behavior. So, you know, who is likely to take the meeting? In the case of a chemical firm, one of the real critical issues mm-hmm. early in the process is I want people to run experiments with my on their bench with my chemical versus another chemical. And if I can have them run the bench test, they'll see that my chemical composition is stronger for this plastic, right? right? So conduct the bench test. Right. How many bench tests did we have this past month? How many bench tests were conducted? Did it, right? So, and by the way, bench test is not that, it's not that, don't adopt my product. Just do, do the, the bench, bench test. test. Do just do the bench right. test, you know? That's all much I e- It's a much easier thing to ask for, right? Yeah, right. Much easier. Right. And I guess in the case of Sparkle, it's, uh, you're segmenting around a propensity to want to sample. Correct. Right. Correct. Interesting. Interesting yeah. concepts. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go to the third principle of drivers and barriers. I think most companies always think about drivers yeah. and they tend to ignore the barriers to those behavioral changes. Can, yeah. you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's very funny. Bob loves to talk about the idea that people love to talk about drivers and they don't like to talk about barriers. <laughs> but, you know, barriers are, you know, there, there's some almost hygienic barriers. So if yeah. I go back to my mustard example and I go to the mustard aisle and there's no poop, grape poop on the mustard shelf, <laughs> I'm kind of screwed, right? I can't sample great coupon, right? So, you know, it's, so, so right. barriers are things that we, we, we tend to be, you know, innovative, surprising, exciting, creative. So we tend to think about what are these drivers, right? But lots of times it's the barriers that really influence the behavior change. Huh. And so we need to understand some of the barriers. So for example, in energy services, what we found with those facility managers is if you try to sell a multi-million dollar project, they had to get a capital outlay, they had CFO approval, they get procurement blah, blah. But if you could stay below $50,000, they could make the call. And so they could make the call mm-hmm. to do a, try out this new, uh, this new uh, thermostat, right? And we'll install it in building A for less than 50,000 and you'll see the ways in which it operates to manage climate control and you'll be able to see the energy savings in that building by one month in a one month. If you see the energy saving that one building will now run across all your buildings, now it's a multi-million dollar outlay, but we already have data that shows that it works, right? So we had to break down the overall, not selling the bundled services and breaking it all down to sell a little thing they could sample with to make the impact. Now, why is that important? Everybody out there in industrial goods right now is trying to sell bundles. (laughs) <laughs> Where there's a huge capital outlay. And what we right. is, no, no, you have right. to have some ways right. for them to sample yeah. you in a low cost mm-hmm. way where they have confidence then to go ask for the multi-billion yeah. dollar bundle. You know, uh, bundle. Similar story, I think, exists very much in, in large software enterprise sales. Because it's, it's a big, big sale, involves a lot of decision makers, and it's a hard decision for companies to make. And um, they're always trying to go for the entire sale versus trying to get their foot in the door of some small way. That's a great right? question. Yeah. If there was a, that's a really, really interesting observation. Because yeah. oftentimes you're going to spend 10 million, 100 million, right. a billion maybe on an enterprise system that goes right. global for these gigantic companies. But if if if, one, if I was a vendor and I said, hey, listen, for $20 million, we can run this, I can run the whole process in unit A. And, and people say, well, it's not unit A, it's the whole business. Well, let me let me just show you. For 20 million, I'm running at unit A, and show, and I'm going to show you the cost savings in and in, in, in two years for A, and it's only 20 million. But at the end, I'm going to ask you, you know, to all in, it's going to cost you 350 mm-hmm. million. Let's just run this experiment for 12 months. Mm-hmm. If somebody could do that, I don't think they've done that, AJ. I haven't heard that. But if they yeah. could, man, I'd be the vendor selling that yeah, stuff. Exactly right. Either piloting in a small business unit or one aspect of the functionality, right, yeah. as a way to get yourself in. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've, I, we've at my company, we've been out looking at many different enterprise uh, software systems, right, and the sales approach to us has always been it's all or nothing, and right. it's always a very, very, it's a big decision to make. Right, yeah. and and and, yeah. and we know that. So right. I love the idea. And even though some could say, yeah. well, it doesn't represent the entire enterprise, the whole point is to be enterprise. You say, yeah, yeah. but you can't, really, you can't figure out a pilot in some division hmm. that's separate in some way, shape, yeah. or form, and we can demonstrate how this right. works, you know, or even a division that's loosely coupled with the rest of the company yeah. so that it can kind of stand alone for this particular experiment. I think it would be brilliant. Sounds like companies like Oracle and SAP could, they should really read your book. Well, or hire me for services. <laughs> exactly. The, 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 uh, yeah, this is the new SMA, yeah. you know, offering of uh, how we offer it. Yeah. 
It, you know, yeah. but it's funny though because people. What, this is the other thing. This is really important here. Conventional industry wisdom. Conventional industry wisdom is conventional industry wisdom. It's not necessarily reality, mm -hmm. but the conventional industry wisdom is you only sell the whole ERP. So the beauty of conventional industry wisdom, it gets people stuck in a model that thinks this is the way it has to be. Take my business school. Mm -hmm. Here, the, the conventional model is you have to have something called faculty, and they have to stand in front of the room and do something. Well, is that true? <laughs> do you really have to do that? Right. So challenging these strongly held assumptions okay. <laughs> gives people a runway for advantage. So if somebody coming up with the ERP right. system, they could do this. Everybody would look at them saying they're nuts. Right, it's exactly. a dumb idea, right? Yeah, right? So conventional industry wisdom, by the way, that relates back to our segmentation story. Yeah. There's, I know there's some people right now listening to this, listening to us saying, hey, Bernie, there's no way in hell we're going to segment the market differently. That's a really <laughs> stupid idea. And I think that's great because there's a competitor out there that's not going to do it. it. We'll, yeah. we'll do it, right? Yeah. And yeah. so this conventional yeah. industry wisdom is really, yeah. really interesting yeah. because that's where you gain big time advantage is to look at that problem yeah. somehow differently and not accept Southwest Airlines. They didn't accept right. hub, and, hub and spoke, right? No, no. They said point to point, yeah. right? That's conventional wisdom. Flip it on its head, head right? Yeah. Look at it differently, yeah. right? And so I think that's where people huh. get stuck a lot is they get stuck in this is the way we do it. Right, right. And, you know, I don't know if that's right. So, in, in the book, um, I don't recall exactly where, but you put it all together, and and you talk about you and Bob talk about the real, the, the, the big importance of putting this all into a form of a narrative. Yeah. Can can you talk about that? That's a big, that's a big thing with me personally about creating narratives. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So Bob tells the story back in the '90s where uh, he, uh, we, Monitor had just collected data from several hundred target customers mm -hmm. and did a comprehensive survey and had lots of data on attitudes, desired experience, their context, their buyer behavior, their pricing. And Bob was going through this multi-hour presentation around these customer data that was coming back. And somebody in the back of the room said, well, that's a little inconsistent because I just met with Frank and Frank is, you know, blah, 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 blah. Frank doesn't do it that way, right? And the whole room shifted to Frank. <laughs> Bob's got 350 data points, right. and, and the whole market campaign is going to build on Frank. Point. Right. <laughs> and, and so Bob left that and said, you know what? That story, that narrative is really important. Mm -hmm. If I can tell so what we did is we, we, we ended up telling the story of Frank, but in the context mm -hmm. of the segments. <clears throat> so here's Frank. He's in propensity segment A. Here's Jane. She's in propensity segment B. Here is, you know, here is Matilda. She's in parentheses mm -hmm. segment C. So we bring the stories to life, <clears throat> the narrative, in the context of the segment, and tell the story of, in this case, we're organizing our narrative not around the product. So most people organize their customer personas around products and services and offering. We don't do that. We offer our narrative, our persona, around the behavior change, because that's the behavior change we're trying to drive. Now, is the persona around a value proposition or offering important? Sure, but you have to have one around the behavior change. And so it's the story, the narrative, mm -hmm. that turns out to be very important. So part of our process, figuring out drivers and barriers, and then taking them and port them into a narrative. And when you read the narrative and people say, that's my target customer, be like, yeah, okay, that's it. Yeah. In fact, what you do sometimes is you show the narrative of Frank, and you say, here's Frank's narrative. And then for someone in Salesforce that says, hey, I sold to Frank last week, you know, <laughs> You know, da -da, then you kind of got it. Right, it's a way yeah, to test it, yeah. you kind of got it. So that's a very new concept. Uh, so everyone knows about value propositions, right? But it's really around the product or service offering. I think this concept of value proposition for behavior change, is, is, that's a brand new concept. It's a brand new concept, yeah. yeah. And it's different. You know, it's different. This took us a while to figure out, by the way, because even up till 2010, we didn't have this thing thought through. So in other words, uh -huh. 10 years into it, we didn't hmm. have the notion of behavior change value proposition. And we started to write the book we started to realize, oh, this um, this notion of a behavior change value proposition is a logical extension of drivers and barriers to the behavior. So we need a value proposition for the behavior change. Mm -hmm. That only came to us about seven or eight, nine years mm -hmm. ago. Uh, when we started crafting the book and we realized that here's a better way wow. to do it. Wow, and you reduce it to, I think, uh, motivation, opportunity, and ability to change. Yeah, right? so uh, if you look at most, and this is really an academic exercise, if you look at most academic literature, around changing the behavior yeah. of individuals, you have to play with three variables. We call it the ammo model, ability, motivation, uh, and, and opportunity. Opportunity being time. So if you want to learn how to play tennis, 
you know, you've got you got three variables. Number one is you have to have some ability to play tennis. You have to be motivated to take the lessons. And guess what? You have to have time, right? So I may have lots of ability, but I'm not motivated in enough time, right? That's a problem, right? On the other hand, I'm being highly motivated to play tennis. And I've got lots of time on my hands, but I don't have any ability. Really? <laughs> yeah. Or I just so, like most of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So unfortunately, you know, you have to have you have to have all three of these. Like, okay. So when you think about behavior change for anything you're doing, you got to play with all three of those. Three are all three are necessary. Each of the three are necessary conditions. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Now, by the way, you don't have to be perfect. You know, what I mean, but, but yeah. you have to. You know, you got to be. Yeah. You got to be thinking about all of those. Yeah. So, uh, the idea translates to the basically the segment that you're targeting based on the behaviors that that they're exhibiting. Yeah. Right? So all three have to exist. Yeah. 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 So uh, you know the uh, you know it's teenage girls cosmetics. If I'm going to uh-huh. apply that story, they're at the point of purchase display. You know. Do have they ever used makeup before? If they've never put lipstick on, or they never put, the, you know, they, you know, you can certainly play around that, right? But right. They, you know, they're they're going right. to practice, right? Are they motivated? Well, you know, a lot of teenage girls that have a propensity to want to mm-hmm. try are, are you know motivated mm-hmm. to try, and then they have to take time at the point of purchase display to actually play around and do that stuff, right? So you know, you get and more, they go with their friends, and they go with their friends, friends. right? Yeah. So that 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 wolf pack sort of mentality is is uh, is important. The other thing that teenage girls do a lot is, and this may be surprising to moms. But these 12, 13, 14 year old girls like to shop with mom. Mom, because I'll tell you why. Mom has something called cash. Very important variable in terms of influencing teenage girls. Now, mom at the point of purchase display has ability. Right. So she can help the teenage girl apply it, you know, help So it doesn't have to be you that has the ability. It's yeah. gotta be yeah. Yeah. somebody has to somebody have the ability. Somebody has the ability. You gotta give you Got a, it. Get your learning curve on how to do yeah. this stuff. Yeah. So and, and a lot this is so exciting and it uh, it really it does bring marketing concepts to the twenty first century. It sounds like a lot. Um, you are the peer after record chair. It sounds like a lot of the concepts you and Bob are talking about, the methodologies you are talking about in the book, have some drug game principles. Uh, yeah, I mean, that. so that you know, for those uh, that are listening in here, I mean, you guys may be aware of this, but it was it was Drucker who really originated the idea of customer centricity. Customer centricity is something hmm. we use all the time now, uh, but Drucker used that term back in 1954. He may have used it before that, I, I, but my tracking goes back to 1954. Uh-huh. Now, keep in mind what the world looked like in 1954. The world was a, a world where you had limited supply and unlimited demand. Right. We yeah, had a was, world the where war, there wasn't mustard, 87 boom. musters. There yeah. were like two musters. If they're on the shelf, <laughs> you're going to buy the mustard. Right? If you had a car that worked, it would sell. Right? <laughs> you had lots and lots of economic demand, but you just didn't have as much supply. Our world today is you have you know tons of supply and not as much demand, yeah. so it's a much more competitive world. But in that mm-hmm. world, he talked about the idea of deeply that it was about the customer, and it's not it's mm-hmm. not what you're selling; it's what the customer is buying. It was a really profound set of ideas back in 1954, particularly in a world where you didn't have to be customer oriented; you could just be supply oriented. You know, here's a car, buy it. You know, <laughs> and so he, you know, it was you can t- t- trace the thread back to that to those kind of his early thinking. Yeah. This is truly exciting, and it's really fascinating having, having the ability to have this discussion with you. What's next after the Organic Playbook? So uh, there is two books that I'm playing with right now. Uh, the first book I've, I'm almost done. It's ten chapters, and I'm editing chapter ten. So we're supposed to have this publisher last week, hmm. which means hopefully next week. Um, but the book is on. It was based upon. Uh, it was, the trigger mechanism was we're doing work for a charm with my, one of my PhD students, Virginia Chung. And, uh, and Virginia said, this, this CEO of this mid-sized firm wants to talk to you about Peter Drucker's philosophy. And I said, great, I can talk to him about the Peter Drucker philosophy. So we get on the, the Zoom call with him. Uh-huh. Uh, this is a couple of years ago. And, and he says, hey, Bernie, I, I, I want to talk about Drucker philosophy, but not today. He said, I have a product in marketplace. We're doing about 300 million a year in revenue. And my product is one of the best, by a lot of people see it as one of the best products, services mm-hmm. in the space. But I don't, you know, I've got a product. I don't have a mission statement, I don't have a vision, I don't have a purpose, I don't have any organizational values. All the stuff that people talk about you need. And I have a culture, of course, I've been in place for a while, but I don't know if it's a good culture or bad culture. Can you help me with that stuff? So think about it this way. Mission, vision, and purpose set the direction for the company. Mission, vision, and, and purpose. purpose. Okay. Which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. Okay. And then behind the scenes, the the culture and the values relate to how you get it done. Okay. Mm. So 
long story short is we wrote a book uh, on <laughs> mission, vision, purpose, culture, and values. Yeah. And that's part A of the book. And part B of the book is the view of Confucianism and Drucker's view on mission, vision, purpose. <laughs> okay. So we blend it in. Very Chinese, kind of like Confucianism has a point of view around society and functioning society, right. around how you should live your life and blah, 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 as does Drucker. And so the foreground of the book is all of our work mm -hmm. around thinking about these three, five concepts. But the mm. background is we use some of the foundational thinking of, of Drucker and Confucianism. So the publisher asked us to make an English version, so we're working with our publisher, Emerald, and we're getting English version out. The only, the only, there's a few additional tweaks in the English mm -hmm. version, so we added two chapters on how to do it. So how do I create my own mission, vision, purpose? How do I create my own culture and values? So we have a couple chapters there. So that book will be done, it'll be in the market uh, spring of next year. The other book, which we're in the midst of crafting the book proposal, is taking Peter Drucker's work into the 21st century. Wow. So That's I, big. So the idea would be <laughs> to craft a uh -huh. book that talks about socially responsible managers that are dri driving purpose-led companies, hmm. that are helping society function, uh, hmm. and speaks to the, the, the folks that are 20 to 35 right. years old around what they want to accomplish. There's a lot more in this book, the idea, Peter Drucker, because he was writing back in the 50s and 60s, a lot of, and even the 70s, a lot of the examples are companies that don't exist anymore. A lot of the leaders that he chose and were, you know, and this is just a historical period of when mm -hmm. men, white men, you know, with glasses that were older were running companies. And we have much more diversity and inclusion. So we're bringing a lot mm -hmm. more, a diverse set of leaders in play around that book. So we're in proposal mode right now. So that book probably won't come out for another 75 so years. So a lot of his principles seem to be evergreen, yet the context has yeah, the changed. Principle, the principles are evergreen. Yeah. The principles are evergreen. Yeah. Huh. yeah. Well, we'll be all looking forward to both of those books coming out. I presume they'll be available on Amazon. They will be. Okay. Yeah. And of course, you want all of us to put reviews. Uh, that would be correct. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Way in advance of their publication, ideally. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Bernie. This yeah. has been a delight, and I've learned so much, and I think our audience member has also, they've all have learned so much from this conversation. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I'm looking forward to explaining the next books that I write to you uh, <laughs> when we get together next. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. Definitely. Take care. Okay. Thank you very much, Bernie and AJ, for a great presentation and a shout out to Lexi, our tech director, for him, her impressive graphic implementation of the Pepsi Coke challenge and the Grey Poupon mustard commercial. This brought back so many memories and boy, do I love Grey Poupon de Jean. But I'm more of a water drinker, so the Pepsi Coke challenge didn't resonate with me. These are great examples of companies trying to accelerate their growth through novel marketing that is designed to influence the buying decision process. Anyways, I just have to say, wow, I learned so much about the organic growth playbook. My favorite section was unearthing the critical drivers and barriers of target behavior. I started to think about my own drivers and barriers when purchasing a product or service. I'm always influenced by art, graphic models, and images. And for barriers, I know I tend to shy away from small print and red print. Something about reading the color red does not agree with me. And now I know what to be aware of when helping with proposals. Also, the mapping buying process waterfall sounds like a lot of fun. With this global town hall, we will be conducting a survey at the end of the session to find out your own attending process waterfall. Be sure to participate. I'm about ready to turn the session over to AJ, Bernie, and Jacques in the studio. But first, I'm excited to announce that you are all winners for attending today. Please keep your eye out from an email from Ella Olson asking for your ship to address for the book. Shipping may take a few weeks because Bernie will be busy signing all those books for you. There's so much valuable information here, and just one of them is figure 12.1, Growth Roadblocks and Playbook Solutions. Such great material. Now over to the studio. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nicole and Bernie. What a great discussion. Um, this, this brought back so many ideas uh, that that I was you know starting to have after our, our interview. Me as well. Yeah, yeah, and it's like I there's no I, I want to be the sparkle and the ti of our industry. Josh. That's right. <laughs> right? That's what we right. were talking and, during the yeah. during the presentation. And I, we want to help our clients be the sparkle right. and the ti of their of their customers. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Indeed. Now, <clears throat> Nicole, I know who to ask for a jar of grape upon mustard now when <laughs> I need to spice up my sandwich. 
<laughs> and feel like I own a Rolls Royce. <laughs> and I really am excited that, that we're able to do this today. Um, so thank you, Bernie. Thank you, Jacques. Um, and so for our audience out there, we do want to let you know that we're going to take these concepts and actually create a offering at SMA around those principles for our clients. I'm very excited to be working with uh, SMA on this project uh, and moving forward as a, as a critical resource for SMA. I also want to shout out to the uh, Drucker School is also having a partnership uh, yeah, with SMA right. in terms of various right. initiatives and research uh, and client opportunities that are also there in front of us. And my last point before we get started is for those who were with us the last town hall, global town hall, we talked about Drucker principles and how Drucker like SMA is as an organization. And I also want to underscore that point. Great. Thank you. All right, so let's, let's see uh, what questions have popped up in the chat. Plus, AJ, I know you and I both have questions that, we, that we'd like to pose as well. We do. So, uh, Nicole, can you uh, check the chat window, see if there's, uh, if we, I'm sure we've got questions. In this sure Absolutely. We do. we do have a few questions. So the first one is, how do you distinguish segmentation on the demand side from positioning as it was taught and learned at Drucker in the 90s? So, I mean, there still is a way to think about positioning an offer relative to a segment, right? That, that's kind of a classic thing that we do. And I think that's still relevant today. So I'm not saying positioning the offer is irrelevant. I think it's necessary, but not sufficient. The new twist here is we need the behavior change value proposition in addition to the product value proposition. So think of that training as essential, as necessary, but now not sufficient given the way that we thought about the organic growth playbook. By the way, one point I want to make is that I see that both uh, AJ and Jock have uh, good questions here. Okay. I need my answer sheet. I, I, no one gave me the answer <laughs> sheet. I have to make mine up real time. It doesn't seem fair. I should have an answer sheet to the questions that are being proposed. But so I, I'm forced to be real time in terms of my answers here. So this, you are. The bar is a little bit higher, uh, so to speak. But I was going to tell you about my show for some time. <laughs> okay, good, good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have the Rolls Royce, so, but you know, there it is. <laughs> Okay, another question in the chat. Once a company changes the game like Southwest did, how can or should traditional players respond without doing the same thing again by following the new segmentation? Yeah, so the tricky part is you got to stay ahead of where they are. So once Southwest makes a move and says it's short haul, long haul, you've got to figure out what do I do? So there are a few options. Number one is how do I think of the market even differently than that? That's an option, right? So, so think, think of different ways to think about our propensity to engage in a behavior about how consumers actually use the airlines and so forth. So try to think differently about that. Interestingly enough, the second move that you can make given Southwest establishes is to basically say, we're gonna be the long haul guys. So if you think about Emirates Airlines, you think about Singapore, they're playing long haul. That mean, do, they have, do they have domestic travel? Well, guess what? Singapore is only 20 miles by 20 miles. They don't really have a big domestic <laughs> Air flights yeah. kind of happening. There's no, there is an air flight. You go up in the air, you land back. Maybe a helicopter. You can have that in Singapore. But you really can't. Have, there's not. So the point is, there's opportunities for long haul. If someone redefines the marketplace and leaves the space open, which is what Southwest did, you have an opportunity to go there. But my recommendation would not. Be, my recommendation is to start all over again and start to look for other behaviors that are upstream. That we're going so to on that, on, on the on the the airline was such a great example here for Southwest because it was such a dramatic uh, change in industry. That must have been really problematic for uh, US based uh, firms that serve both uh, transoceanic and domestic markets where clearly the transoceanic um, flights right there, they could very clearly double down on the first class business class um, premium coach coach and however many other <laughs> proliferation of right. classes there are. But domestically, that must have been a really big um, paradox or challenge for them to think about, well, do we become more like Southwest? Or, or do we continue to stay the same road and how do they make themselves distinctive? And yeah, I think, you know, we all fly a lot and yep. frankly, there isn't much of a difference between sitting in a business class seat and sitting back in the coach these days. These days, that's right. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the fundamental problem was hub and spoke versus point to point. Yeah. Okay. And if you're organized to be hub and spoke, you can't just change to be point to point. You're kind of constrained. A in fact, capital, the case, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. In fact, the case yeah, study I wrote at the day, mm -hmm. I, I read back 20 years ago when I was teaching the Southwest case, 20 25 years ago the case ends with one of the senior leaders of that airline saying you think we're stupid we know what southwest is doing it's just that we can't do that you know that's not an option for us right so they're stuck in the hub and spoke model right 
Uh, but, you know, the interesting question would be, all right, given that they have point to point, now what is the other game that we can play? So rather than sort of say hub and spoke is the baseline, is there some other game that we can play? Now, you know, th what happened at the time, 20, 30 years ago, is some people tried to do point to point, mm -hmm. right? Some of the, uh, they did. and they just couldn't do it. Yeah. Because you know, yeah. it, it was ran in the face of kind of what their model is. But markets evolve, right? So whatever the heck Southwest is doing is good for a good 10, 15, 20 years. But five or 10 years from now, there's going to be a completely different innovation, and that's going to reshape what Southwest does, right, in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. So, for example, the use of technology to really – JetBlue was basically the first technology-enabled mm -hmm. airline, right. right? That's kind of what they did. That was their big card. Mm -hmm. But in today's world, where we have chat, GBT, and other AI evolution, there's a generational change that can happen in terms of in terms of what you can do in terms of airlines. Yeah. It's going to have to yeah. be about the information flow, right? Yeah. Something about the information flow, where the airline gets you point to point, but something about the information flow that allows you to gain advantage. Now, we know Southwest is very far behind on, on AI and on, on basic sort of software, so there is probably an opportunity Let's here to play. Let's discover this, yeah. this, this winter, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Now, on the other hand, what, what I think the major airlines uh, failed to really see and anticipate was how the OEMs, Boeing, right, Airbus, were able to extend the range right. of their 737. The so that Southwest started to do point to point, which was literally across the country now, right, versus right. the short haul. Yeah. So that, that's, I think that whole uh, airline transportation industry is really a ripe area around all these interesting disruptions. Well, you raise a really interesting question. <laughs> you know, right now we have the airlines that are filed. Southwest says we need this type of plane, mm -hmm. right? And so Boeing makes that type of plane, right? We know, for example, in China right now, the forecast is that 50% of all new travel is going to unfold just within China from an airline yeah. perspective. So China's developed their own airline that's a low cost supplier to the Chinese market, right? right? That's probably, interesting enough, that sort of reverse innovation where they play in China and they reverse innovate with a plane that's a lot less cost structure. And it's and optimized much, right, exactly right. for those so, so they go into the yeah. Southwest model, but basically say we're a lot less yeah. expensive and we're just good at quality. You know, there's, there could be a play there. I have another question for you guys in the okay. chat. Um, is advantage of this new segmentation approach that it's innovated or that it's right? Ooh. <laughs> it's, it's both. Uh, it's both. It's both innovative in the sense that no one else is kind of going upstream and playing around with looking at variables like this to change this, right? So in the case of the, the chemical firm we talked about, it's getting the bench chemists to actually try it out in their in that target client organization. That's a different way to think about it, right? But it's also right in the sense that once we figured out that downstream they bought seven x the amount of, of chemical product from that company, if they engage the, in the bench test trials, it's right. So it's both innovative and it's right. So you have both of those solutions, if done properly. Right. Oh, we've, I think, Oops, there we go. I'm back. Great. Uh, other than observations or surveys, how do you collect data on where customers are falling off in the buying process? Well, first off, as you're an academic, you have to have a pair of glasses when you give a talk. This is very, very important. AJ's wearing his glasses. Any good academic uses the glasses to actually point and make particular <laughs> kind of observations. And that's kind of critical to the process. You don't really put them on your face and kind of point with them to make the critical observation. So your question is about customer insight. And what you're saying is, you know, how do you, how do you think about the nature of customer insight? What tools are you used? Well, you know, obviously today, you know, for online consumption, you know, you don't ask anybody, you just look and scrape and look at what's happening online. You can track their behavior. So for pure play online plays, you don't even have to do the serving quality of stuff. Unless there's some in insight you're not getting, you can actually look at shape of the behavior and see where they're falling out of the process. So that's an innovation, right, around what is happening. And so a lot of us can begin to use a set of online insights that we've never had before to figure out what it looks like. But generally speaking, the more complex the problem, the more you want to use multiple data sources. You want to talk to your sales rep, you want to talk to your customers, you want to kind of do interviews, you want to get data quantitatively in terms of other, you know, other and so you want to use multiple sources to go to kind of different looks at the elephant that are there to kind of get a richer understanding. But it goes back to burden of proof. In some cases, our clients will spend a million dollars, two million dollars on a market research study. In other cases, you know, you're not going to spend any money. You're going to basically, you're so new to the market, you want to talk to 10 customers, sit back and reflect, and then have a theory, a hypothesis about a behavior change and then go ahead and test it, right? So there the data collection is two or three weeks and doesn't cost much money, it just costs time, right? So hmm. the burden of proof is really the variable of what we need and also the timing of what the, what's happening in the marketplace. Okay, great. And then one more audience member asked, at what level of your business should you segment markets? And does your market segmentation approach differ when going from brand to product? 
family to distinct product or individual UPC? Uh, yes. <laughs> so the answer is, can you apply segmentation at different levels of the company? And the answer is, it depends on what your question is. So the answer is, yeah, in some cases, you're, you're segmented at a corporate level because you're trying to figure out something related to the corporate brand. In some cases, you're at a division level because you're trying to figure out what is happening with that overall division that's operating very, very differently in another division. A lot of what we do uh, in the organic growth playbook is at the product level. You know, we have a product in the marketplace that's not producing the revenue that we want, or we have a new product being introduced that's not producing the level it wants. So you're at the product level, but you can also be down at the level of the brand, individual brands that are within that category. So the answer is it really depends upon the research question, but segmentation definitely exists at different levels uh, within the organization. That's part of the complexity too of why it's oftentimes a tower of Babel because you see many different segmentation schemes. The Salesforce segment one way, the marketer segment another way, the R&D guys folks another way, corporate segments another way. And so when you use the term segmentation, it's kind of like a Rorschach test. You know, people don't understand what you're talking about because there's so many ways that organizations segment markets. The beauty of the organic growth playbook, I think, is that when we do it at the product level, we get multiple functions involved. So we can coordinate the conversation around R&D, marketing, sales, manufacturing, supply. So everybody's using the same language system, which oftentimes is a problem inside of companies. Hmm. You know, Bernie, I know you spent a bit of time at Coke, and one of my favorite examples of market segmentation is the way they looked at the beverage market, you know, relative to Pepsi, right? Because they were eking out micro fractions of percentages. And when they did their, went through their segmentation exercise, they, they, they changed from looking at the beverage market to looking at how much of the, how to segment the stomach and how much of the stomach they actually own. And it was a small fraction of the stomach, right? It's a really interesting question, right? This is a market definition question, right? right? right. Like, how, do, mm. how do we define our market, mm. right? So if I'm running, if I'm being rewarded based on market share in my market, my market's going to be really tightly small. Right. Guess what? I have 87% of the market, right? But oftentimes where opportunity comes from is your definition of the market. If you broaden the definition of the market quite broadly, all of a sudden you realize, man, I have a very small share of wallets, the stomach. Yep. I have share of stomachs much smaller, right? And so there's an incentive uh, for the organization to find markets broadly and look at market opportunity broadly. Yeah. And that's true of the waterfall. You're looking broadly. You're unconstrained at the segment level, right? But the problem is that I, as an individual manager, and my reward system is based on market share, I'm going to want to segment the market more. Yeah. So there's a little bit of a conflict there. But I think you want to look also, the other thing is that there's, there's supply side market definitions and demand sides market, you know, ways to segment markets. And you want to think about it from a demand perspective, right? So what products do I think are substitutable? So for example, let's just take transportation again, right? You know, if I'm going to go here to San Francisco, I could be looking, I'm in LA right now, and I go to San Francisco, I could be looking at air travel, right? That's one way to think about my market is air travel. I'm traveling on business in San Francisco. Well, there's actually something called trains in California. So there's an option <laughs> on taking a train. There aren't many, but there are. Yeah, yeah. Say, what California yeah. are you in? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, by the way, they don't go anywhere, but, but they, they exist. Very, very important point. And they're not on time, but that's another problem. But, but so I can take a train, right? Uh, I can also drive, right? Mm -hmm. There's also bus services where you can kind of have limited Wi-Fi and do, do work. So you're working right. the hype, right? So what is the size of the market, right, for transportation? And what does that look like, right? So these are really interesting questions around market definition. And those are... I think typically when, you, when you're looking at an organic growth opportunity, you want to start with this notion of what is the market definition mm -hmm. and figure out what we've yeah. agreed upon the scope of the market. And then within that context, then figure out what do we do to set mm, Cool. Nicole, are there any more questions? Uh, yes. Okay. I have another one for you. Um, an audience member would like to get your thoughts on the future of media. From the mix of the past, TV, radio, print, outdoor to now social media and streaming is there room for traditional media in the future i think there's a lot of room for traditional media in the future i think the real so the the term that people last time use today is omni-channel you know when the going gets tough the consultants invent new terms uh, so <laughs> this used to be called multi-channel uh, but now it's called omni-channel and in those three years we called something supersonic channel or something like that'll be some other label to it but the basic idea is this the complexity is you've lost control in the old days, when I did advertising, I had control. When my sales force went out to speak to customers, they had control. When I did public relations firms, it was a PR media stuff, they had control. But now in a world where the feedback loop is there and customers can take control of the narrative, take control mm -hmm. of the brand, take control of the conversation, now you've got this feedback loop that's coming back in, right? And so the, the big change here is thinking about giving up some of your ways of taking control of the conversation and letting your consumers take control of the conversation. 
The other part is there's many different third channel ways to kind of go to market now too. So the problem is that, you know, I, I sell my product, my product gets resold in ways that I can't even expect they're going to be resold, hmm. right? So I've lost control of some of the channel stuff too. The answer at the end of the day is the blend, right? But in my, in my world, it goes back to what's the behavior change that I want to create. And if I'm creating a particular behavior change, what we found historically is that it's not typically five or 10 or 20 different media choices, both new and old media. It typically comes down to one or two uh, that are really critical. So this, again, narrows the marketing spend against those one or two. Now, there could be new media, there could be mm -hmm. traditional media, but you're not looking at 27 marketing vehicles. You're looking at three or four that shape that particular behavior at that particular point in the buying process. And that's the critical issue. I do think it's important that, that that changes all the time, right? In other words, you can't, things are moving at almost the speed of thought now, right? And and so those channels are going to continually change. The channels yeah. change and markets evolve. Customers are yeah. looking for different things at a speedier level than they were before. Uh, do you have any more questions, Nicole? I think it's time for you guys to ask your question. Right, okay. And I think we've got, and by the way, please hang on. We still have yet one more a really exciting segment in this this town hall. But I do have a, a couple of things. First of all, the whole concept of the the share of the stomach actually my it's a bit of the SMA story. At the very beginning of our firm, we really kind of had that slogan: "When you must win, you need doers, not advisors." Yep. Really about us coming in with full, complete teams with leadership, right? Our process, a whole bit that really served the firm huge success uh, through the '90s and I think the mid part of the two thousands. Today, we've actually broadened the market. I mean, I think in terms of why there's a propensity of, mm -hmm. of why clients will, will buy what we have to offer is around that concept when something big is at stake, right? Um, uh, they're, they're more willing to bring in or need to bring in something from the outside that kind of can bring that full service offering. Also, uh, I think in the last five years, we've really done a better job as a firm. Also, our clients many times have a very critical gap in their own teams, maybe one or two people, but a very specific gap, which now I think we got a lot better filling in. So, right. so that whole concept, I think, is just re really resonating with me. But let's say you're a firm and you're not a new startup, right? Uh, and I don't know if Sparkle was a startup or not, but and it's all about thinking about at the very start of it, it's changing. Uh, it's a behavioral value change proposition, right? Mm -hmm. Not a product. Mm -hmm. how, 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 and you want to implement these principles. How would you measure yourself? What are the, what are the things you would look at that, that you would say, okay, I'm doing a great job or not doing as great of a job. So the key about behavior is you can measure it. So looking upstream mm -hmm. and finding a behavior. So taking a meeting, doing a trial, doing a bench test, all those things are behaviors that we can actually quantitatively track whether we're driving that behavior and in turn, how much that behavior is correlated with downstream revenue change, right? So the beauty of what we're doing here is we're actually tracking this behavior and we understand the behavior, we can measure the behavior. Now we need to put in tools in place to kind of measure that behavior. So we, this, for the very first time, we're not talking about attitudes, we're not talking about motivation, we're not talking about beliefs, we're talking about behaviors that we can actually measure. Now, typically it's at the target segment level because it goes back to our propensity-based segment that we're going to mm -hmm. target this particular behavior. Right? So we're going to do that. Can I also underscore at this point, it's a little bit off tangent, but it's really important, conventional wisdom. This goes, mm -hmm. we talked a little bit about conventional wisdom here. You know, that, that girl's cosmetic story was there was just a strongly held belief in the room. There were 40 people in the room, all of which had, you know, 20 or 30 years of experience. There's a thousand years of experience in the room. And basically, there's two schools of thought. It's about celebrity advertising, finding the right celebrity that teenage girls really like and admire and want to emulate. Or it's about social media and getting the right influencers and tracking how they typically behave. Those were the two schools of thought. That was basically the test. Go out and find out which one wins. And we, we didn't do that. We went out and said, so let's take a look at the end and buy process, figure out what's going on. And the 12% versus 76%, once we came back in the room and shared that data, the room was like, oh, okay, well, I guess we have to think about it a bit differently. So the data was the vehicle to be able to challenge the conventional wisdom. But we can all challenge conventional wisdom. And I think it's a really big takeaway for today mm -hmm. is what's the conventional wisdom of your industry? Because yeah. that conventional yeah. wisdom is oftentimes wrong. And, but it's how we do things. It's how we behave, right? right? Going back to tech assessments again, one of the interesting things back in the 90s was the notion of the fab. You had to have a fab in place. Uh, to, right? It was a billion dollars, right? Yeah. And eventually someone said, maybe we don't need a fab, right? right. And so, you know, the industry flipped. So the right? fabless uh, uh, yeah. semiconductor companies, yeah. right? Where yeah. they outsource the fabrication. Yeah, yeah. 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 exactly. Yeah. yeah. Wow, cool. Such great ideas. It gives us so many ideas for our own business because our business, our clients are so 
deeply steeped in conventional wisdom about why right. they're selected on big contract awards or why their customers think their programs are successful. Right. So we got a lot to talk about on this. Right. We do want to move on to the next section. And so, and this just this discussion can go on forever. Yes, it can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, so Jacques, I think uh, we, we want to talk a little bit about the book and and what we're going to do with uh, with with the book in terms of as our giveaway, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. So, uh, first off, uh, Bern, you know, thanks, Bernie, for um, and I don't want to repeat Nicole's earlier uh, earlier words around. Uh, you know, first off, you're all winners. You're all going to get a copy <laughs> of this book, um, and it will be autographed. So. We're going to get you one of those arm braces, Bernie. It's so good. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and so please keep an eye out for for the note from Ella uh, asking you to, for your ship to address because mm -hmm. we do want to get these to you. Um, and it's an incredible read. I've read this book now uh, three different times. I actually have two copies of, the, of that book <laughs> on my bookshelf because I got it early on when AJ first came back to the firm, and then I then right. then I then uh, as we started talking about this again, I went and got another yeah, copy. And we got to give a copy to our, our sales team. We, oh, doubt. absolutely, <laughs> yeah. There's no doubt about that. I love that. So it, I, I saw the documentary of Bill Russell last night, uh -huh. and Bill Russell uh -huh. never uh -huh. gave autographs his whole career, and he was there was a lot of pushback. Oh, that's like it. Tiger Woods, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Never so gave autographs, yeah, yeah. even for his friends that asked him uh, did yeah. he give autographs. But in this case, we are giving autographs. They're all going to uh, be autographed, right? Cool. It's special blue ink, uh, and uh, the street yeah. value, therefore, the book goes up yeah. relative to the non autograph right. version. So it has additional value in the marketplace, we hope, uh, with the <laughs> autograph. So uh, crack your knuckles, Bernie, because you're going to have a lot of books to sign, I think. Yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> Happy to. So, uh, and for all our SMA associates participating in today's town hall, uh, you're going to actually get an organic growth playbook training certificate in your in your Todd profile um, as part of our training. Indeed. Um, your training tracking our training. Yeah, and and Bernie, as a thank you, I want to present to you SMA's very own books autographed by Jacques and I. Ah, you know, yes. you know what's funny about this? I actually own these already. What? But I don't have the oh. autograph version. So now I'm going to sell the autograph version in the open marketplace, given the price difference between the non-autograph and the autograph version. So thank you very much. Yeah, uh, fantastic. And so. Um, so yeah, so what we're gonna we promised a survey, right, Jacques? I think. We did. Yeah. 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 So uh, Lex, if you wouldn't mind, please load uh, the attendance waterfall survey into Zoom. Um, there are five questions. This is rapid fire. You'll have a minute to answer the five questions, but please take the time to do this. It's important for us to get yeah. you know to get your perspective on on uh, the town hall timing um, and you know and the things you'd like to hear about. So while you do that, I'm going to ask Bernie and Jacques these questions. Right. So length of the global town hall. Too long, too short, or just right? This is the Goldilocks scene. Question, that's right? That's right. Yeah. Well, for me personally, I actually thought it was just right. Me too. <laughs> I thought it was way too short. <laughs> okay, All right. Okay. What days do you prefer for the town halls? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday? Or Saturday or Sunday, I will add to that. <laughs> uh, I kind of like the end of the week, so I'm, I'm a Thursday, Friday Thursday, type of okay. guy. Yeah. I'm a Thursday guy. I like Thursdays. I'm, I'm with you both on that. Now, prefer time slot. Before lunch, at lunchtime, or after lunch? I like lunch. <laughs> you know, so, so I kind of like the you know the nine ten yeah. o'clock time frame you know uh -huh. you know because you kind of get your uh -huh. day started with something relevant. You're right. Now, if you do that lunch, are you going to put grape coupon on your sandwich? <laughs> ah, that's really good. And then we could have Coke. And we Coke. have Coke, Coke, yeah, grape coupon. Right. Yeah, right. yeah. Right. And the other part of your stomach, probably Fritos. I think one of those companies yeah, owns that's Fritos. Right. Right? That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the other guy owns Fritos. Yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. So I know that. <laughs> also, we have a question about additional topics <laughs> and other comments. So please complete the survey. Um, and we'll just give that another few more seconds, I think, right? We just want this to be really rapid fire. Thank you so much for filling out the survey because this helps us improve our town halls. You know, we started these town halls as a way to get our team through COVID and, and we found customers wanted to join. And then we started the global town halls and now everyone says, do not ever stop the town halls, particularly the art talks. That's, I was gonna say yeah, that, particularly AJ, the art talks. Yeah. Particularly the art talks. I think in fact, it could just be the entire art talk and people would still attend the town hall. <laughs> I think you're right. I think you're right. In fact, I think we've, I think that we've gotten that feedback before. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. All right. So I think uh, we're good on the survey. No, we're not going to get a few more minutes. Okay, fantastic. A right, little, little yeah. more time. <laughs> so you, you notice yeah. that, AJ. This is, what the, this is what our director said. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so anyway, so I think, first of all, um, this has been a great session lots and lots of ideas uh, and bernie's going to help us implement uh, and create this offering at sma yep, that's right around our and and our traditional customers actually don't think this way 
uh, they're very program centric. They're not product centric, and even more so, they're not behavioral change. That's right. Uh, a centric. They typically segment their markets. Almost every one of our. It's just like the story you told. I go into any one of our clients and basically say, you know, I just came from this other client. Yeah, I won't name the the, the company, but. Oh yeah, I just saw this crazy segmentation. They they segmented by military service and by mission area. And <laughs> isn't that crazy? <laughs> I gotta try that out on the next time, right? right? But actually, you know, an idea there is 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 companies have very specific specialties around specific technology. They what do. if they actually segmented their their DOD customers around technologies versus missions and other things? So right. anyway, lots of lots of ideas here for us to consider. Yeah, and certainly the ones we were talking about, you know, about our own business. So as we yeah. were sharing ideas during the during the presentation. Indeed. Yeah. All right, let's go on to the last segment here. Sarah offered to share her very quick review of another example of organic growth from Banksy, the Banksy land. It's a very unique model. And so over to you, Sarah. Great. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Art Talk 135. We're back this week with more Banksy, famed incognito street artist. But this week we're looking at uh, the current touring exhibit of his work titled Banksy Land. Here is a photo taken by SMA's own Liz Stillman. Uh, the entrance to the exhibit reads, today you will experience the art and ideas of the artist known as Banksy. Our team has traveled throughout the world to bring this collection of privately held original works, hand-pulled screen prints, and depictions of Banksy's public graffiti works brought to you in actual size and in vivid detail from more than 30 locations across the planet Earth. I think it's also important to mention that this exhibit is not endorsed or sanctioned by the artist himself. It's being produced by a Portland-based company called 1000 Ways. So here we can see one of his stencil pieces displayed on a stone wall, kind of as if it were being seen in the real world on the side of a building. As we know, Banksy doesn't shy away from social and political hot button topics. Uh, this stencil shows a young boy and girl with a teddy bear and a heart balloon standing on a mountain of guns and various weapons. Um, the piece we just looked at actually is in the background of this photo. Um, but you can see that the exhibit also includes replicas and reimaginations in 3D of some of his work. This is called Submerged Phone Booth. It was originally done in 2006. It shows a red phone booth, a quintessentially British symbol, rising up from the ground, splitting the cement as it bursts through. And it's really supposed to be a commentary on constant societal change, the uprooting and replacing of the old to forcibly make space for the new. Here is a piece that was reimagined. Elephant in the Room was done at a Banksy event in Los Angeles in 2006. So he actually painted a live Indian elephant in the same pattern as the wallpaper of the room that the event was held in. Um, of course, Banksy Land doesn't have an actual elephant touring the country for this exhibit, but they have created quite a realistic replica. Here's a wall showcasing various prints and murals of his. Everything in the exhibit is claimed to be authenticated by Pest Control, which is Banksy's company slash website uh, that's responsible for all authentication and verification. Um, however, I will mention that a criticism of the exhibit is that the authentication of the pieces does remain a bit elusive. Um, on this wall, we can see some favorites of his like Flower Thrower on the bottom right and Love Rat in the top center. Uh, this piece is again, pretty blatantly satirical. Sorry, the lifestyle you ordered is currently out of stock criticizes consumerism in general, um, and also the way art collectors might purchase a piece, not because of its artistic qualities, but rather the lifestyle and status that it's meant to represent. Uh, Banksy's original piece was actually spray painted over a very aesthetic Damien Hirst mural, and then it's also been done in black, the black and white iteration that you can see on the right. Now, I will say the issue I take with Banksy Land here is that the whole point in this piece is a commentary on aesthetics and status, and Banksy Land does choose to portray the slogan as a cute neon sign, maybe assuming and hoping that people would want to take photos and post it, which personally I feel kind of defeats the purpose, but I'll leave that up to your own personal judgment what you think. 
Here we have um, another iteration of Flower Thrower, again, um, one of his more popular murals. The original one was made in the West Bank in Palestine and features a man throwing a flower bomb over the wall. And as well, we can see on the left, Girl with Balloon, which is another one of his uh, most famous motifs that he started in London in 2002. I love this quote. People either love me or they hate me or they really don't care. Uh, it just really encapsulates the kind of artist and person that he is. He's caused controversy in the past with his blatant commentary on police, oppression, violence, and other themes. But that's really what makes his work unique and thought provoking. Um, on the right, the Red Horseman mural is originally um, in the 19th arrondissement in Paris, but it's a play on a historical painting of Napoleon crossing the Alps on horseback. So overall, the Banksy exhibit has raised moral, ethical, and legal questions. However, the case can be made that we need an exhibit like this because his work is so spread out over the globe that most people wouldn't be able to see his art up close if it weren't for Banksy land. Uh, but I'll let you be the judge of that. Banksy land is soon to visit Cleveland, Kansas, Tampa, and others. So you can check and see if it's coming to a city near you. <gasps> Thanks, everyone. Well, once again, thank you, Sarah. That's that was fantastic and one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, next week, we're back with our regular town hall celebrating March as Women's Month, which we've done in the past and we've had a really good time with. Indeed. And so I think we're going to say, guys, that's, that's a, a wrap. wrap. Take care, everybody. It's great <laughs> to be with you today. Thank you. Bye bye.